Okay, before you're done with the video, let me be clear. Rain World is great. I love Rain World. I do not make hour and a half long videos about things I hate. This isn't me saying Rain World is bad, actually. Rather, the point is, Rain World is bad at doing its job as a video game. Rain World is not like the other girls. It is wholly unconcerned whether or not you succeed or fail. Even if you die, the world goes on. The cycle continues. You are insignificant. This lack of player focus is the reason why tons of people bounce off the game after only a few hours, why the game is so inherently frustrating frustrating. Because, yes, sometimes you can just lose through little fault of your own. It's punishing, but it's intentionally so. It's the kind of punishing that can make people hate the game. It's the kind of punishing that made me hate the game the first time I played it. I love Rain World now, but I don't think that it validates my initial experience with it, an experience that, let's be real, tons of people share. And I think that's worth analyzing, worth deconstructing, even critiquing wherever I feel Rain World's stubborn resistance to game design gets in the way of not just accessibility, but pure playability. I'm going to have to say some unkind things about Rain World, but know that they're coming from a place of passion, not a place of disgust or pointless negativity. And there will be some spoilers for Rain World and Downpour. This isn't a tell-all video, watching it won't ruin the game for you, but it's going to be impossible to avoid talking about some of the game's mechanics and locations just by the nature of this video. Right, so with that out of the way, where to begin? Well, at the very beginning, of course, Rain World's tutorial. Evidently a concession on the part of the game devs, and boy howdy does it show, because the tutorial itself was about as bare bones as it can get. You're shown the controls, you're given one singular pole to climb, a few tight spaces to automatically squeeze through, a few pipes to traverse, a few bad flies and fruit to consume, and one singular movement tutorial for pounds jumping, then BAM, the rain's coming, time to shelter. Right, so, okay, in terms of level design that teaches you the basic mechanics, it's fine. You understand some of the mechanics just by the nature of traversing the landscape. That's good. That's smart level design. What's more pertinent is what's not here. You learn how to pounce jump, but there's no platforming besides that. No simple but basic test of your normal jump, and no mandatory use of your, in my opinion, awkward to learn while jump. The former, I kind of understand. You build up understanding of the physics as you play, so fair enough. The latter, huh? Like, I know it doesn't come up that much, but it comes up just as often as long jumping, and as far as wall jumps go, it's clumsy and unintuitive. You have to hold against the wall you're jumping off of, and you need to at least have initiated a sliding state, so there's both unusual input and unusual timing. I still occasionally mess up wall jumping, even with 240 plus hours under my belt. I wish I understood wall jumping sooner. It feels like something that could have easily been worked in, yet it's just not. And speaking of movement tech that tutorial doesn't teach you, Rainbow's movement tech is wacky, man. And there's so much of it. As far as the tutorial is concerned, there's running, jumping, squeezing through pipes, climbing poles, and pouncing. And while, yeah, obviously that's to leave room for experimentation and organic or an accidental discovery of other movement capabilities. For example, backflips and rolls are movement tech that I think most every player is going to stumble upon pretty easily. There's also like slides that I cannot fathom someone coming across naturally because it's both a really finicky input and just not natural as far as sliding goes. And it's in my opinion one of the most essential pieces of movement in the entire game, so... Combat 2 is not really tutorialized. You're quickly given two weapons, rocks and spears, but it's not immediately obvious that rocks barely deal any damage and the majority of creatures you're going to come across in outskirts are lizards. Green lizards primarily, who even if you do work out that their heads can't be pierced by spears, even if you do work out that you can toss rocks to flip them over and expose their weak points. They take so many spears to kill with no indication that any damage is being dealt until like the 4th or 5th spear that a new player may just well assume that they can't actually be killed at all. It's not exactly a great setup for learning how to fight, even if the enemies you're put up against are admittedly some of the easiest to fight in the entire game. I ragged on it in my region ranking video as well, but swimming is also just not tutorialized at all. Hell, there's one single puddle in all of Outskirts and not much more in Industrial. And by the time you get to garbage base, the game is already throwing leeches into the water, so it feels like you're expected to have some grasp of swimming by that point. Which, the first safe place I can think of to experiment with swimming in a meaningful way is the pipe room at the start of Shoreline, which is notably after garbage wastes. Which sucks because, like I also previously stated, swimming in Rain World is so cool. The physical feeling of swimming, the fact that it's not just total control set to go in a direction in a way that makes sense but feels unnatural by video game standards, the fact that you have a last resort boost that consumes air with hardly any indication that this is actually happening until you start drowning. Like, it creates such a barrier to entry to actually understanding swimming, such high risk when failure means death, that it turns off most people from even bothering to try and learn how to swim. And look, a lot of the counter arguments to tutorialization are arguments against hand holding, which the game doesn't really even do in what little tutorialization it has, or that it breaks immersion to have a tutorial, which y'all. If the point of Rain World is to get immersed in your role as a slug cat, then uh, you realize slug cat would already know these things, right? It's the player who doesn't know how to slide, it's the 
player who doesn't know how to swim, it's a player who doesn't know how to press jump and grab at the same time to do an explosive jump as Artificer. Giving the player this base level of information only helps make them more immersed in that role. The tutorialization falls flat in other ways too. Like, for a game that's designed to be open world and non-linear, the few text tutorials that do happen only really exist along the intended path. The only scavenger toll tutorial is for the eastern garbage waste toll, and the jetfish tutorial is only at the western entrance to shoreline. Take any other route other than the intended route, and you won't get these tutorials until long after they're helpful. And then there's the Spore Puff and Randu tutorial in Farmer Ways that's so woefully vague it's barely helpful at all, and may even be actively confusing. It's half measures all the way down. Don't even get me started on the loading screen tips, which swing too hard the other way towards being overly helpful, also to the point of teaching you random tech at random times in a way that just confuses new players even further. Why this option is on by default is beyond me. Tutorialization is, and always has been, Ray World's biggest weakness, the biggest turnoff to new players, and, I mean, it's easy to see why, right? If the game asks you to dig a hole to China and it doesn't even bother to give you a shovel, are you gonna go find one yourself, or are you gonna turn around, walk away, and never look back? Rain World is so much more than not scratch a drainage system, and it's a shame so many players never get to experience most of it because the game starts out so openly hostile to them. Oh, and speaking of outskirts and drainage system, outskirts, the tutorial level, the starting zone. I have a lot of good things to say about outskirts, actually. I said a lot of good things about outskirts in my region's ranking. It's perfectly sized, streamlined in design, but not overly linear. Great spawns for the beginner players, some interesting platforming and maneuvering puzzles. It's basically all you could ever ask for in the first zone of Rain World. Except, okay, so I made it a point to state that Outskirts map was designed in a way that naturally funneled you to drainage system, which is decisively not where you want to be going. Let's interrogate that argument so I can better explain what I mean by that, and bear with me here, this might be a bit repetitive, but it's to prove a point. So, okay, from the first shelter, you only really have one way to go. Up. You come across a room with two paths, one exit is on the ground, the other requires a pole climb. The ground path is, in this case, the path of least resistance. So you go right, then up into the next room. Now from here, there's two exits, but one requires a fairly tricky jump, while the other simply requires a pole climb. You take the easier path on the right. Unseen land starts playing when you enter this room. Clearly, this is the room the devs intended you to go to. So at that point, it's clear you're intended to take the path of least resistance to progress through outskirts. Now from this room, there's actually two equally easy paths to take. This is, after all, the big left right split of the entire region. Let's put a pin in the right path for now and follow the left. The next room has two more equally easy paths, but the down exit just loops around to a place you've already been, so left it is. Again, a room where neither path is particularly harder than the other. The right path is going to go to where the earlier right path would have eventually led anyway, so we'll get back to it then. And past that point, the rest pretty much speaks for itself. You're already in the trap. You have no choice but to go left in the next two rooms, reaching the tall vertical room where two exit pipes are out of sight on the upper third of the room, and the path of least resistance is down to the path that funnels you directly to the drainage gate. There's even a shelter down here and some of the easiest food sources in the entire region to help you farm up karma, since you're probably short one or two by the time you reach the gate. You followed the path of least resistance and that's where it took you. Alright, but what about the right loop? Well, the entire path invariably circles all the way back around to the top shelter room, at which point either you go down into the left right back to the same path we just discussed, or straight left to the lizard head room, probably the single hardest platforming slash maneuvering obstacle in the main body of outskirts. Curious players may try and scale it and come across the gate to industrial. Players following the path of least resistance will take the lower route, and again, in doing so, you're all but locked into the same route. The next two screens, you have no option but to go left. The curious player may perform the long jump to the western exit of the tall room, and end up on an even worse path than the one in the drainage. The rest, downwards they go. Again, by strictly following the path of least resistance, you end up at drainage. That's what I mean when I say the level design naturally funnels you in a direction. You have to actively choose to fight the natural flow of the region if you want to make your way to where the game realistically intends you to go. It's an active rejection of level design philosophy. The most frustrating thing about all of this is that it could have so easily been prevented with just the tiniest, tiniest change. All you really have to do is modify the room before drainage, the long sewer tunnel, to have a mandatory, madly tough swimming challenge. Not flooded tunnel difficult, just like something that would force players to show that, yes, they could handle what drainage has in store for them. The region's already perfectly set up for it. There's a danger-free pool of water to play with swimming mechanics right outside. And this one singular challenge inherently cuts off drainage system as the path of least resistance in outskirts, too. It kills two birds with one stone in the least intrusive way possible, without sacrificing Red Bull's naturalistic level design. As it stands, the only, only barrier to entry drainage system poses is its moderately high karma requirement, but I mean, it's only one karma higher than the gate to industrial. The gate to farmer raise, on the other hand, is locked down tight. You have to get through some of the toughest platforming in the region, deal with more difficult spawns than anywhere else in outskirts, pass a scavenger toll that only has one reasonably attainable problem for it, tucked away in an obscure, hard to find location, and have five karma to pass the region gate, the maximum possible. Absolutely nobody is going to farmer raise as their second region, and that's for the better. Having just the karma system as a progression 
Mission Blocker is just not enough. Oh yeah, speaking of, the Karma System. I understand why the Karma System exists. Without it, there's no real punishment for dying. Without it, there's no way to prove your ability to survive. Without it, there's no way to prevent unprepared players from entering regions they absolutely should not be going to. Except, wait, no, go back to that first point again. There's no real punishment for dying? That ain't true. You can lose upwards of 10 minutes of progress from dying. That's a lot. And wait, prove your ability to survive? That's all fine and dandy for the more explorative regions, but you're telling me I need to somehow farm up 5 karma on the other hand, the most linear region in the entire game, to enter 5 pebbles? And wait, what? I thought high karma requirements, especially the 5 karma gates, were there specifically to discourage a route. Why is the high karma requirement on what is very explicitly the intended path? I swear, the single karma gate may actually be the reason why I don't like the other hang or the wall, because it renders the former nearly pointless, and the latter functionally required, despite it intentionally being designed to discourage scaling it. Topped off of a mandatory, somewhat obscure, never tutorialized spear trick if you do somehow make it to the top. Like, I'll concede that I'm cherry picking, the second and third arguments do generally hold water for the vast majority of the game, but it's the first one I can't get past. The first one being why I ended up safe scumming my way through the game the first time I played it. Because it just sucks. It doubles down on punishing the player for failing. Not only do you lose all the forward progress you made during a cycle, but now you're down a karma level to boot. You've in fact made negative progress. That feels terrible. It invokes like an emotional death spiral where once you've failed once, you're gonna keep failing harder and more spectacularly until you get so frustrated you don't even want to keep going. To add to that, if your karma gets low enough, now you're either trapped in the area you're exploring or you can't even get back to where you were because your karma dropped below the karma threshold. So you've got to go grind up more karma to get back to a high enough level to even be allowed to keep doing what you were doing before. And why does my survival platform in game have grinding? Ugh. And the grinding is almost certainly expected because the natural result of entering a new region for the first time tends to be dying. A lot. Until you get your bearings, until you learn the lay of the land. I like that part of the game, I just wish it wasn't burdened by the karma system. Like, the only way it could possibly be worse is that the game also functioned on the live system, which it does in expedition mode, but we'll ignore that for now. But like, when you die in Mario, you lose a life, but you're usually not losing, you know, 10 minutes of progress. The checkpoint was, at most, a minute or two ago. Die in Last, you're losing at most a screen's worth of progress. Very, very few screens last longer than like 15 to 20 seconds. Dying in Rain World, not only are you set back all the time you spent in that cycle, but you're also set back all the time it takes to get your karma back up. The cruelest part of the whole endeavor is that, and this is just me theorizing, but it's not an unfounded theory, I suspect the karma system itself is a concession on the part of the devs. I would not be surprised to learn that a very, very early version of Rain World just straight up had permadeath, and someone had to tell the two man dev team that, no, that's a bad idea, don't do that, bad dev. So the karma system is born, but it's born out of spite, out of a compromising of the original vision, so it still hates your guts anyways. I've never learned to love the karma system. I've merely learned to accept it and to try to render it a non-issue by simply not dying. But even then, it still reaches ugly head every now and then, and whenever it does is the exact moment I stop having fun with Rain World. It's just bad. Right, I think that covers all the major issues I have with Rain World's design, the big reasons why I really didn't enjoy my first playthrough, but there's one more overarching issue that I've always been weirdly bothered by, even if it's more of a nitpick than anything. But it's my nitpick, and damn it, I'm gonna talk it to death until everyone else sees what I see. Or in this case, here's what I hear. So, like, one of the coolest decisions Red Bull makes is in regards to its sound design. And not just, like, the noises made by creatures or the various ambient sound effects, but, like, specifically threat music. Threat music is a brilliant concept that's simultaneously really cool while also patching over a lot of the inherent limitations of Rain World as a 2D game. Like, in Rain World, you are a slug cat and the goal is to make you feel like a slug cat, but you don't share the senses of a slug cat. Because it's a video game, and as of yet, we've not found a way to convey touch, smell, and taste digitally. I'm sure someone's working on that though. But as a 2D game, sight is also not conveyed that well. Slug cat can see off into the wild blue yonder, but the player can only see one screen at a time. That's a problem. The disconnect from Slugcat's senses is a problem. So when Slugcat senses a threat, the, well, threat music starts to kick in. It's often the first sign that any danger is approaching before you can even hear or see the threat. A lizard looming just off screen, a vulture swooping down from the open skies, hell, you can use threat music to tell if scavengers are hostile or not, because even with their incredibly complex body language, it's not really feasible to tell at a moment's notice. It's a very organic way to work around Rainbow's limitations as a video game, and it helps with the tunes themselves 
themselves tend to be absolute jams, too. So then, can someone tell me why exactly the rest of the game's music works the way it does? Why it supersedes the threat music for the entire duration of the song? Look, I love Rain World's soundtrack, but the plain and simple fact is that a lot of it comes at the cost of taking away one of the game's most useful tools. Taking away your slug cat's senses, leaving you, the player, to rely only on what you yourself can see in here. Why do I have to sit through the entirety of the six minute long urban juggle before I get my senses back in the first region of the game of all places? That's like, that could be an entire cycle, my dudes. At best, half of one. It's just a baffling decision to me. One that drives a wedge between the player and Slugcat while also just straight up making the game harder. Like, okay, yes, not all regions have threat music to begin with, but the neat thing about that is that the regions that don't tend to be regions where Slugcat senses are already impaired. Shaded Citadel has no threat music because it's pitch black and you can't see a thing. The electrified gloomy atmosphere of the leg and the underhang, the high altitudes of the wall, the hot, humid, and close spaces of drainage system, the deep, dark, underground tunnels of subterranean, yeah, those are all places I'd expect Slugcat senses to be messed up, not the friggin' lizard head room and outskirts. Is this really a big deal? Should I really be ranting this much about what is, in comparison to everything else I've talked about, a fairly trivial flub? I mean, probably not, but it is a flub that, in my opinion, significantly impacts the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay whenever it does occur. It's a strange piece of game design, especially for a game where one of the big selling factors is getting immersed in your world, getting immersed in your environment. Which, that's always the tagline the way criticism often gets waved away. Rain World is a simulated ecosystem that you are merely a part of. You are not special. The world is not meant for you. Whip out that bad boy and watch any flaws, any counter arguments crumble to dust. But like, hmm, is that actually true? Like, that point boils down to Rain World is not a video game, basically. Or at least, it's not trying to be one. And something that isn't a game can't have game design flaws. Doesn't need game design to begin with. Which, like, I mean, if you want the most unplayable, unfun mess of an experience ever, I guess. But Rain World is obviously designed with intent, designed with playability in mind, even if it's obstinate about it in a lot of ways. Like, take the most obvious factor, the physical world design. Across the entirety of Rain World's map, both in base game content and in downpour, there is not a single dead end anywhere. At absolute most, there'll be one-off side rooms where, like, a collectible is hidden or something. Every path you can take leads somewhere, whether it's a loop around to somewhere else in the region, or a path to another region. Rain World wants to reward exploration, wants you to always be finding something new so there can't be any dead ends. That's good game design. There's also like virtually no way to get stuck in a room. I only managed it once ever in the Sky Islands room where Saint spawns and only because I tried climbing up the left wall with the copious beers the game provided before realizing it was a dead end and then didn't have enough to climb back out on the right which yeah that's a one-off not an overarching flaw. Most every room in the game you will be able to reach at least one exit if you poke around enough. There are rooms designed to be one way sure but nine times out of ten that's the game working in your favor to keep you from backtracking to somewhere you've already been, and you can usually find a way to backtrack anyways, so. I think Rain World's map is very elegantly designed, giving every region its own unique feel just to the way the land itself is shaped, the way the rooms connect to each other, the way it often still feels naturalistic despite how handcrafted and fine-tuned it is. It feels like a place rather than a video game level, and it does so without sacrificing game design. But it's definitely made for the player. It's just too convenient not to be. Speaking of the player, if the argument boils down to the player is on the same level as every other creature in the game, then, uh, I don't see it. The most obvious factor is actually in perspective. Rainwell's creatures, or at least the ones blessed with sight, all have vision cones and at any given time can only see whatever is inside that vision cone. As you can clearly see from just watching the gameplay footage on screen, uh, Slugcat is not limited by that. Slugcat is an all-seeing god who can perceive the world in its entirety. Unless it's like pitch black, of course. If you wanted to put Slugcat on the same level as everything else, the entire game would be played with, like, the line of sight bot except even more restricted to just be in front of where you're currently looking. Yeah, no, it wouldn't be fun, it wouldn't be fair, and it would ruin how goddamn gorgeous the game looks, too. Another big and obvious example of the fine knowledge Slugcat has is actually one I've already discussed, threat music. Even if you can't see or hear a creature, you can know it's there just by hearing the music kick in. Every other creature in the game is limited to, at most, sight and sound, Slugcat has all its senses and a completely different perspective on the world. It's unfair in your favor. But that's the thing, it's balanced just right. Most everything in the game that can kill you can do so whenever it wants. Most slugcats, besides Gorman and Artificer, of course, can't fight without a weapon. The only other creature this is true of is scavengers, which are, you know, the player analog, so slugcat needs that advantage, the ability to scope out the environment and strategize, the ability to perceive danger where it should otherwise be impossible to stand much of a chance. And I could probably go on all day about other miscellaneous ways in which Rainworld is clearly designed as a game first and foremost. The Overseer, for example. Why does it latch onto specifically you, the player? Why does it help 
help out you and guide you through the intended path of the game. You know what else doesn't really make sense from an ecosystem perspective, but is really damn helpful from a game perspective? Creature color coding. Especially with lizards, they come in a veritable rainbow of colors, and each and every one of them tells you up front how it's going to behave by that color coding. Which is, for the record, a huge color blindness problem, though most lizards have different builds and shapes too, but I digress. Why did all these lizards evolve to color code their abilities like goddamn Pokemon? The funny thing is, both these exact points I just brought up actually have pretty well defined lore reasons. I know why the Overseer latches on the slug cat, I know why lizards evolved to be color coded, but it's kind of a case where the lore seems to exist to explain the game's mechanics, not the other way around. Which is something that I feel holds true for a lot of Rainworld's lore, funnily enough. Like, and this is kind of spoilery in a way, the rest of this video hasn't really been, but have you ever thought about why the cycle as a concept exists? It's rooted in a lot of Buddhist spirituality, the eternal death and rebirth of all living things until they achieve a high enough level of karma to reach nirvana. I get that much, but that's not quite how the concept works in Rain World. No, the way it works in Rain World is respawning in a video game. You die and are sent back to your last save point as if nothing happened. Like if you died in a Mario level and were sent back to the last checkpoint, or you game over to the Final Fantasy boss fight and had to reload your save, etc, etc. The concept clearly exists to try and explain how you can die in Red World and still continue playing after that. It exists to make the game more player friendly. But like, it doesn't make a lick of sense even then. The way it's explained to work is basically the cycle you died in keeps going without you, but you're born in another cycle, another timeline parallel to the one you died in. So it's like every single creature in the entire world is experiencing save and reloads from their own perspective forever, creating an infinite number of parallel cycles where everyone is the protagonist of their own story. That bad file you just ate? Yeah, it's gonna wake up again in the new cycle you aren't experiencing. So, okay, there's an infinite number of parallel timelines, which means that the entirety of Ranworld's story from beginning to end all doesn't happen in the vast, vast majority of all parallel universes. Spearmaster doesn't deliver any messages to Pebbles, Artificer doesn't slay the Scav King, Hunter doesn't revive Moon, inherently making every other future Slugcat story completely impossible in the process. Hell, we don't play it, but there's probably a timeline where Spearmaster never delivers the forbidden Pearl to Pebbles in the first place and the rot never comes into existence. The existence of the cycle is, from a storytelling perspective, an absolute disaster, because it's impossible to tell a coherent, believable story when only one out of literally infinite possibilities is perceived at any given time. But, I mean, it's brilliant as a means to explain dying and responding in a way that's coherent with the rest of the game's lore and themes. It's just, again, way too convenient to be anything other than good game design. Which is, like, the point I'm trying to make here. I don't actually think Grand World is a bad game. I don't think Grand World on the whole is poorly designed. It definitely has poorly thought out elements, ones that can occasionally impede your enjoyment of the game, but nothing really ruins the game, and it more than makes up for it in what it does have to offer. It's one of the best looking games I've ever seen, with the single most compelling world in any game ever. It's an absolute technical marvel, with gameplay driven almost entirely by incredibly complex creature AI, and so goddamn many different creatures too, creating an emerging gameplay experience that keeps it nigh infinitely replayable. It's got some of the coolest, deepest movement in any 2D platformer ever. It's got one of the most compelling, emotionally resonant stories I've ever seen in a video game. And by god, I wish it was more keen to invite players into his world so they can really experience all that. Like, if you're paying attention, most, if not all, of the game's major overarching design flaws are front-loaded, stuff you can encounter with in your first hour of playing. The kind of design flaws that leave such an awful first impression, it's really hard to fault anyone for bouncing off the game early. The kind of design flaws that make it hard to recommend Randall without a bunch of caveats attached. The kind of flaws that made me hate it the first time I played it. Rain World, especially after Downpour, is one of my favorite games now. I don't see how any game possibly tops Downpour for my game of the year, short of, like, Silk Song actually being released, but I'd be lying to myself and to y'all if I said it was a flawless game. It's not a bad game like the provocative title states, it's a good game, a great game even, but it's definitely a video game, and holy hell is it bad at doing its job at being a video game, at inviting players into its world and giving them the tools to survive. And I don't think it's fair to the game, fair to any other game, to dismiss their flaws. You can't can't ignore away flaws, and you don't need to try to excuse the boy either. Things you love can be flawed, are flawed, and that's fine. The quote unquote perfect experience does not exist, will never exist, and seeking it is futile. I love this flawed little mess of a game for what it is, and despite all the criticisms I've leveled at it in this video, I'm not sure I'd change it even if I could. Except that one white lizard room on the wall, screw that noise.